Matthew 16 verses 21 through 26. The word of the Lord reads today from the King James. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he, meaning Jesus, turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, thou art an offense unto me. For thou savorest or desirest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? I want to talk to us for a while today on the topic, Finding Yourself. Finding Yourself. Will you bow your heads with me one more moment? Master, once again, O oh God, we humble ourselves in your wonderful presence acknowledging the power of God, acknowledging the Holy Ghost which moves in our spirit and bears witness, Lord, to the words we speak and the words we sing and the words we pray. And we're grateful, God, for the move of the Holy Ghost today. We're grateful, Lord, for the shout of victory that wells up within our soul and finds its way through our larynx and emerges from our lips even in times of trouble even in times of trial and tribulation the saints of God can shout because victory is mine hallelujah master in the name of Jesus the word of God is more important than any song we sing we can worship we can sing, we can do those things which inspire and encourage. But it is only the preached Word of God that causes faith to grow and to well up. It's only through the preached Word of God that we tap into the truth of God and are able to benefit by faith from the promises of our Creator, our Redeemer, and our King. Touch today, O oh God, with that holy anointing, the preacher of the gospel, that I might do justice to the message you've laid on my heart for the people of God. Touch the ear of every hearer. Lord, those today who are saved, those today who know you, who walk in relationship with you, allow them to receive the word of God for the betterment of their walk with you. And Lord, for those that don't know you, allow them to receive the word of God that they might believe unto salvation. Oh, Master, today, move by your Spirit. Use your word to save, to heal, to deliver. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Many people today find themselves on a journey. Oftentimes they call it finding themselves. I'm trying to find myself. If you're one who's ever watched the sitcom Mike and Molly, you know that the character Molly goes through a period of time where 
she leaves teaching and she dabbles in writing and she begins to try to you know become a writer because she thinks that's what she wants to do but then as time goes by writing becomes difficult for her and she's not so sure anymore that writing is what she wants to do and she winds up going through a period of time that she describes as trying to find herself Sometimes we're uncertain of where we belong and what we should be doing. But the Lord himself clearly articulates the way for us to find ourselves. He explained in our primary text today that finding our lives, listen carefully, requires that we first lose our lives. As God's people, we must set our own lives aside so that we can find the life that God himself has planned for us. Of course, this requires that we first trust the Lord enough to believe that his plans for us are best. In our primary text today, the Lord and Peter have a conversation that deals with the conflict between spiritually necessary and human carnal preference. Peter couldn't even stand to hear the Lord talking about his pending betrayal and death. But the Lord understood that this painful experience was necessary to his purpose. It was necessary to his journey and his task here on earth. He rebuked Peter for preferring the desires of the flesh over the necessities of the spirit. As believers, we must often weigh the plan and will of God for our lives with our own self-will and our own ability to yield to the direction of the Spirit. But if we are to realize all that God has for us, in the end, we must be willing to endure whatever the Lord may ask us to endure as we journey toward that end. In Hebrews 12, verses 1 through 3, the Word of God said, Wherefore, Seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. He did not enjoy the cross. He endured the cross. I'm going to tell you, there are times when God's plan for your life is not going to be enjoyable, but you're going to have to endure it. Mm -hmm. Despising the shame, there are going to be times in God's plan for your life when you may despise what you're going through. You may despise what you're having to experience. You may despise the embarrassment. You may despise the humiliation. Your uh, pride may go through the meat grinder. Listen, this preacher knows what he's talking about today. Word of God said, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. In 2 Timothy 2, verses 3 and 4, the Apostle Paul wrote to his young apprentice, Timothy, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him 
to be a soldier. A good soldier must go through any number of difficult situations and circumstances. He cannot afford to be distracted by things that may be happening at home or in his hometown. He cannot be simultaneously trying to quell an argument between his two children while also trying to combat the enemy. He can't be resolving a conflict with his spouse while trying to make his way through a jungle. He can't be arguing the merits of one political position or another while trying to break through a door behind which an enemy combatant is hiding. Too many Christians become so embroiled in the affairs of this life, engaging in political and cultural conflicts, and they wind up becoming ineffective in their spiritual mission, which is to seek out and help those who are lost find their way to the cross of Calvary. Too many people in the church falsely believe that they can find themselves on their own. I'm just trying to find myself. They can achieve their best life and realize their greatest hopes and desires without putting our God and His kingdom first. But this contradicts all that Christianity and the Word of God teaches. God's Word clearly states in Matthew 6.33, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Psalm 37 and verse 4 declares, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and He shall give thee the desires of thine heart heart see everybody wants God to just give them what they want he, they want God to bless their choices and they want God to bless their path that they've laid out for themselves and the Lord says no I don't follow I lead and if you're not following and letting me lead you're not a child of God the word of God said for as many as are led by as are led by as are led by the spirit of God they are the sons of God honey if you've got God walking two steps behind you then you are not saved you are not born again you are not walking in relationship with the Lord the Lord does not follow to step in whenever something comes along Long that interferes with your plan and your objective and your desires. That's not how this relationship works. You want to find yourself? You want to find the life that you are supposed to have? Jesus said to find your life, you must first lose it. So you got to get rid of your plan. You got to get rid of Oh, I'm going to tell you. It took me a long time, folks. You know, I grew up in, in church where I was constantly hearing these messages preached that, you know, they take all kind of scripture out of context. Oh, I can do all things through Christ that strengtheneth me. That means whatever I make my mind up to do, boy, God is going to help me to do it. Baloney. Baloney. That is not what that passage means. That passage means that whatever life throws at you, if you read it in context, and look at what Paul was saying in context, he said, no matter what comes my way, no matter whether poverty comes, whether hunger comes, whether nakedness comes, whether peril comes, whether trials come, whether temptation comes, I can do all things through Christ. He was saying, there's not anything that this life can throw at me that I cannot endure and I cannot make my way through victoriously if I allow Christ to reign. 
There's a lot of stuff comes along and crushes people and destroys people psychologically, emotionally. They're devastated by certain things that come at them. And I'll tell you why this happens. It's because they don't allow Christ to have preeminence in their life. I know a couple that I went to church with for many years. I love them to death. I'm not speaking evil of them. But I've known these people for decades. And I heard how they had moved to another state and they'd gotten involved in another church. And they were going through some very difficult financial times, very troublesome times. And somebody, they were part of a mega church. And somebody from this mega church came along and offered them a home equity loan and told them, you know, oh, I'll help you out of your great dilemma. I'll help you out of your trouble. And they were so excited that this Christian was going to help them out of their trouble by giving them this loan. And they, they, they got the loan on their house and all that. And next thing you know, I, I don't know how all of it played out, but I know that all all of a sudden at some point this fellow who had given him a loan suddenly moved in and was was uh, foreclosing on them and they lost their house and they lost everything to this very person who was supposed to be their rescuer who was supposed to be their helper and they were so devastated that a believer, quote unquote, would do this to them, that they literally quit serving God and quit going to church and didn't want nothing to do with church anymore. And and she actually said to me, it just didn't work for me. Christianity just don't work for me. No, Christianity would work for you if you lived the life that a Christian is supposed to live. The problem is you're not living the life a Christian is supposed to live. You're not taking up your cross like the Lord said in our primary text and following him. You don't want to carry a cross. You're not interested in a cross. A cross is spiritual. A cross is putting God's plan for your life first. You don't want God's plan. You want your plan. And you want God to endorse and to support and to bless your plan every step of the way. And that is not how this thing works. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. If I'm living this thing the way I ought to be living it, i got news for you. My faith is not destroyed by my circumstance. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? I don't quit God because things don't go my way. I don't quit serving the Lord because things aren't happening the way I want things to be happening. No, 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 no. When you're living for God and you're walking the way you ought to be walking, then you understand that whatever the circumstance, whatever the situation, it must certainly be part of God's plan. And if it's part of God's plan, then we know at the end of the crucifixion and at the end of the burial. See, in our primary text, the Lord didn't just tell Peter and the disciples that he was going to be betrayed and he was going to be uh, suffer many things at the hands of the Pharisees, the scribes, and so on and so forth. He didn't just say, I'm going to suffer and die. Oh, no. No, the Word of God said, it said, and rise again. But you know, it's funny, because people who aren't walking in the Spirit, people who don't know how to follow the leading of God, they forget that at the end of the trouble is glory. Hallelujah. At the end of the struggle, at the end of the trial, at the end of the trouble, glory to God. I guarantee you, God has got something big because God never ends anything without a bang. Hallelujah! Woo! Glory! Oh, I'm going to tell you, whew, the story of the gospel ends with a bang. It doesn't end with our Savior being crucified and buried in a tomb and everybody going home mourning and grieving. Oh, woe is me! And we serve a dead defeated Savior. Oh, we're sitting around today. I got news for you, honey. All them people who think Muhammad's so great. If he's so great, how come you can go visit his tomb? How come every time, uh, every year, 
of Muslims are supposed to find a way to go on a, a, a pilgrimage to go to Mecca so they can walk around the tomb of Muhammad. Honey, Muhammad is dead. He's buried. My Jesus is not. Hallelujah. There is no tomb in Jerusalem. There is no tomb in Israel with his inscription upon it or his bones within it. I'll tell you, God don't end nothing but that he ends it with a bang. And if you don't understand that, then you don't know my God. People worry about the trouble sometimes. I keep telling Tommy, right now what we're going through, it's not, it's not a joyful experience. It's not a happy experience. None of us are tickled with what's happening right now. If there's anything in the world that we as human beings hate to deal with, it is uncertainty. Now, we like to know what's coming tomorrow. We like to know where we're going to work. We like to know who we're going to work with. We like to know what job we're going to be doing. Am I telling the truth? When all of a sudden, all that certainty and all that surety is pulled out of underneath you, and now you're having to look for a brand new job and you don't know what kind of job you might get. You don't know what kind of people you might be working with. You don't know what kind of expectations may be placed upon you. You don't even know what city you may have to live in. You don't know nothing. And boy, I will tell you, you're walking in the dark. Remember what I talked about? About walking blind and letting the Lord lead. Just put your hand, hallelujah, put your hand in the hand of Jesus and let him lead. Hallelujah. He'll get you safely through. No, it's not a pleasant experience, but I keep telling him, I said, I can't help but believe when this thing is all over, it's going to be better than it was to start. Hallelujah. Why do I say that? Because I know how God works. God doesn't ask you to go through the fire. He doesn't ask you to go through the trial. He doesn't ask you to endure the lion's den. Except that on the other side there is blessing and glory. He asked Job to go through more loss and suffering and pain than probably any human being on this planet has ever had to go through. Losing all his children, losing all his property. I mean, my God, he suffered loss at a fiscal level, he suffered loss at a material level, he suffered loss at a personal level, and then on top of that, he wound up with boils, he wound up with painful affliction, painful affliction. Well, I'm going to tell you, I know what some painful affliction is. <laughs> I've, I've dealt with it, I'm still dealing with it. But you know what? If you look at Job's end, according to my Bible, he wound up twice blessed. Am I telling the truth? Yes, you is. see, God don't end, he doesn't end nothing but with a bang. Hallelujah. He always ends it far bigger than it started. Don't worry about your trouble. Don't worry about your trial. It may be part of the path that God wants your life to travel. But honey, at the end of the burial, at the end of the resurrection, is Sunday. And on Sunday, it's time to get up and get back to work. Hallelujah. The Lord set the example for us, setting aside our plans and our desires, putting the will of God first, and being willing to endure whatever trials, struggles, or even painful experiences that are necessary to our achieving our God-appointed end. Jesus set an example for us of this. Believers want to live painless lives. They want to live free of all trouble and woe, blissfully skipping down the road of life. But this is not the teaching of God's Word, nor is it the example of Jesus Christ. 
It's only when our joy is derived from achieving spiritual goals and accomplishing spiritual ends that we are able to surrender our will to that of the Lord. So long as our satisfaction only comes through accomplishing our own goals and our own desires, we will never be able to find the very joy and accomplishment that we seek. Our success is guaranteed in the end only when we have pursued the will of God over our own. When we pursue our own will and our own plans, our success, listen to me now children, is entirely dependent upon us. Did you hear me now? When we pursue our own will and our own plans, our success is entirely dependent upon our own abilities. And we better hope that life circumstances are agreeable too. Mm -hmm. David was able to defeat Goliath because he understood the battle to be spiritual and not carnal. You see, all of the armies of Saul stood there seeing this giant. They're all here in this giant. And every one of them from Saul down to the lowliest of soldiers was looking at the enemy through carnal eyes. Every one of them. Here come little David. I got lunch. Daddy packed lunch. Wants me to bring it to my brothers. Who's that guy up there in the middle of the valley? What's he talking? What kind of trash is he talking? And David was the only one who had a mindset that was spiritual and not carnal. David was the only one who saw the battle as being God's battle and not their battle. And therefore, that giant wasn't my enemy, he was God's enemy. And if he's God's enemy, my God is way bigger than that giant. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness, have mercy. Listen to what the word of the Lord tells us in 1 Samuel 17, verse 45. Then said David to the Philistine, to Goliath, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defiled, or defied, I'm sorry, amen, whom thou hast defied. Oh my goodness, have mercy. David saw that circumstance very differently than the armies of Saul did. And you know what? Every soldier in Saul's army, including Saul himself, would have gone to their grave if they'd have gone out into that valley to face off with Goliath. The only one who would he caught the only one who was guaranteed success was the one who was walking in the spirit. Because when you try to do it on your own, you're on your own. Right. But when you do it in Jesus' name, oh my God, have mercy. When you do it because the Lord's asking you to do it, when you do it because God has required you to do it and asked of you to do it, then honey, there ain't no failure possible. Hallelujah. There is no failure possible. Glory, I keep telling Tommy over and over again. You know, I said, well, you know, if the Lord winds up having us to move, I said, I'll tell you what, I don't care if he puts us in Alaska. I don't care if he puts us where he puts us. I said, because all I want is I want to see people saved. I want to see people filled with the Holy Ghost. I want to see people healed. I want to be able to be part of a church that knows the power of God and experiences the move of the Holy Ghost. I'm sick and tired tired of being in a community where people don't care about these things enough to sell themselves out to God and to believe God and to exercise faith and to walk in the spirit to be part of this church so we can have those things. Well, I'll tell you, the job God gives him is far less of a concern to me than what goes on with this ministry? That's way more important to me than whatever job Tommy gets. I'm going to tell you a little secret. 
Whatever salary he gets is way less important to me than this ministry being able to achieve the vision that God's given me for this ministry. And I mean that and God knows I mean that. Listen folks, I've lived a whole lot poorer and I've lived a whole lot simpler in my life. Tommy may not be thrilled about going backwards, but I'll tell you, I don't give a flying fig so long as I see the work of God prospering and being blessed, so long as I see a church being raised up like we need in America today. We don't need another church like every other church. We need a church, honey, that is full of the Holy Ghost and power. We need a church where the power of God falls like it used to fall at Riverside, where the Holy Ghost would come down and saturate that place until young people, teenagers, who in a lot of church services, you know, be distracted, passing notes to one another, talking to one another, oh, till them teenagers are drawn in by the Spirit, and you find them running the aisles, and you see them shouting and dancing under the anointing and power of the Holy Ghost. I want a church where people can receive their healing, and receive their victory, and receive their deliverance, and get what they need from God on the first visit. Hallelujah! Then I care about anything on this planet. I'm interested in walking in God's life for me, not my life for me. Oh, children. The Word of God declares in 2 Corinthians chapter 17. Excuse me, Second uh, uh, Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 6. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Not just your actions, but God wants your thoughts to be obedient. In other words, He wants your thought process to be whatever you want, Lord, that's what I'm willing to do. And having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. If you find yourself walking in the wrong direction, you're ready to make it right and get right back on the right path with all the energy and fervor you've got. The minute you identify that you've stepped out of God's path. Do you hear what I'm telling you? That's what Paul means by having in readiness to revenge all disobedience. When your obedience is fulfilled. In the end, our lives as the people of God are dependent upon the will of God, the plan of God, and God's purpose for us. He has not called us to walk with Him one step behind us, but rather He has called us to walk with Him leading. He does not bless and prosper our will and our plan, but He blesses and prospers us as we learn to yield to His plans and His will. In our primary text today, Matthew 16, verse 24, Then said Jesus unto His disciples, If any man will come after Me, let him deny himself. See, before you can find yourself, you've got to lose yourself. Before you can have, you've got to let go. Let him deny himself and take up his cross. What does the cross represent? Sacrifice? No. That's not what the cross represents. The cross represents obedience. 
Jesus said as he stood in the judgment hall, he said, for this cause I came into the world. He said, listen, this is the whole reason I'm here is for what I'm going through right now. That cross is the whole reason I'm here. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? What is God's cross for you? What is God's whole reason you're here? What is God's whole reason for you? Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Because that's what's represented in the cross. It's not about torture. It's not about torment. It's not about sacrifice. It's about obedience. He said, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Now what I'm about to say is going to be kind of hard. Some people aren't going to like it. But I'm going to say it anyway. Because I believe today that there's a lot of people in the so-called Christian church that need to hear it. If we cannot or are not willing to submit ourselves to the will and plan of God for us, we have no business identifying ourselves as Christians. If you're out there and you're trying everything in your power to get God to follow you and to bless your endeavors and to bless your plans and to bless what you've decided you want to do and make you what you've decided you want to be and achieve what you've decided you want to achieve, you have no business calling yourself a Christian because, honey, you are so far from what a Christian is supposed to be, it's not even funny. You're supposed to be carrying a cross, not handing the Lord your cross and saying, here, Lord, here's the custom-made cross that I've created. You can carry it for me, Lord. If you're not willing to submit yourself to the will and plan of God, you have no, no business identifying as a Christian. We have no right to pollute the image of a true child of God by pursuing life on our own terms. Allowing our own thoughts, our own plans, our own desires, our own will to dictate how we live our lives. All the while broadcasting to the world that we're believers. We're born again Christians. I live on my terms. I pursue my own way. I do things according to my own will, but I'm a Christian. No, you're not, baby. So quit calling yourself one because you're jacking up the image of the church before the world. You're destroying, in front of the world, you're destroying the testimony of God's true church. Right. So you better quit. God, I'm going to tell you, hell's hot and heaven's real. And these people think playing games with God this way is going to end well in the judgment. And I've got news for you today. It will not end well. The unprofitable servant shared the same end as those who had never uh, believed and never obeyed the gospel. He was cast into outer darkness with her sweeping and gnashing of teeth. Got news for you, honey. When you claim to be a child of God, but you refuse to do things God's way, you better not think for one minute that you've got heaven secured. Pastor, you're not supposed to preach that straight. Oh, yes, I am. Oh, yes, I am. I know my calling. Don't tell me my calling. This is why today the church is so evil spoken of and Christianity is looked down upon by so many. Mm -hmm. Not because good Christians who live and walk as Christians ought to live and walk are somehow degrading the image of what it is to be a Christian. No. But rather because those who have no interest in carrying their cross and yielding to God's will and purpose for their life are running around screaming their Christians while all the while behaving in ways that are completely opposite and contrary to true Christian conduct. Mm -hmm. Children, I want to tell you today, you might as well make up your mind. If you can't finish the journey as a child of God on God's terms, doing things God's way, then step aside. Stop identifying as a born-again believer. Just stop where you're at. Save yourself the trouble. If you're going to be lost, be lost. No sense, no sense living a half-life 
The Lord said, I would that you are hot, either hot or cold, said, but because you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. God don't deal with people who are half and half. Half committed, not half not committed. Half sold out, half not sold out. You hear what I'm telling you now? We're to live life today as believers. If you're going to decide you can't finish this thing the way it's meant to be finished, then you might as well live like all other unbelievers. Might as well live like carnal men and have the best life that you're able to manufacture for yourself. But do not destroy the reputation and image of God's true church by falsely and wrongly representing the way of Christ. Don't you do it. You, you're, you're walking on dangerous ground. Finding yourself today does not come cheap. To find ourselves, we must lose ourselves. We must lay aside our own lives so that we might realize the life God has for us. In Luke 14, 25 through 30, I'm sewing it up. And there went great multitudes with him, meaning Jesus, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, listen, and his own life also, he cannot, he didn't say he won't or he shouldn't be, he said he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Lest haply, after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. A lot of people believe the gospel, a lot of people obey the gospel, and that's where their obedience ends. Oh, I was baptized in Jesus' name as the Bible says. I received the gift of the Holy Ghost and spoke with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave me the utterance, like the Bible teaches. Boom. That's where their obedience stops, right there. Because the minute they got up from the altar and they left the church, they thought they'd find themselves for themselves. They didn't understand. The Lord said, no, if you're going to find yourself, you've got to lose yourself. If you're going to find life, then you've got to lose the life that you'd like to find. And find the life that I have designed and prepared for you. Oh, do you hear what I'm telling you now, children? Do you hear what I'm telling you, people? I'm telling you, I want to find myself. But I want to find myself in the perfect will of God. Amen. That's where I want to find myself. Hallelujah. I want to find myself in the perfect will of God for my life. To find yourself, you will have to die to self. But the only other option is to remain committed to self. And in that commitment, to lose everything. Jesus said, what good is it if you gain the whole world and yet lose your own soul? Isn't that what he said in our primary text today? Yes. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. If you stand with me this afternoon, I have.